This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 15 Winter Animals. When the ponds were firmly frozen, they afforded not only new and shorter routes to many points, but new views from their surfaces of the familiar landscape around them. When I crossed Flint's Pond after it was covered with snow, though I had often paddled about and skated over it, it was so unexpectedly wide and so strange that I could think of nothing but Baffin's Bay. The Lincoln Hills rose up around me at the extremity of a snowy plain, in which I did not remember to have stood before and the fishermen, at an indeterminable distance over the ice, moving slowly about with their wolfish dogs, passed for sealers or Eskimo, or in misty weather loomed like fabulous creatures, and I did not know whether they were giants or pygmies. I took this course when I went to lecture in Lincoln in the evening, traveling in no road and passing no house between my own hut and the lecture room. In Goose Pond, which lay in my way, a colony of muskrats dwelt, and raised their cabins high above the ice, though none could be seen abroad when I crossed it. Walden, being like the rest usually bare of snow, or with only shallow and interrupted drifts on it, was my yard where I could walk freely when the snow was nearly two feet deep on a level elsewhere and the villagers were confined to their streets. There, far from the village street, and except at very long intervals, from the jingle of sleigh-bells, I slid and skated, as in a vast moose-yard well-trodden, overhung by oak-woods and solemn pines bent down with snow or bristling with icicles. For sounds in winter nights, and often in winter days, I heard the forlorn but melodious note of a hooting owl indefinitely far, such a sound as the frozen earth would yield if struck with a suitable plectrum, the very lingua vernacula of Walden Wood, and quite familiar to me at last, though I never saw the bird while it was making it. I seldom opened my door in a winter evening without hearing it. Who? Hoo-hoo! Hoo-hoo! Sounded sonorously, and the first three syllables accented uh, somewhat like how dare do or sometimes hoo-hoo only. One night, in the beginning of winter, before the pond froze over, about nine o'clock, I was startled by the loud honking of a goose, and stepped to the door, heard the sound of their wings like a tempest in the woods as they flew low over my house. They passed over the pond toward Fairhaven, seemingly deterred from settling by my light, their commodore honking all the while with a regular beat. Suddenly an unmistakable cat-owl from very near me, with the most harsh and tremendous voice I ever heard from any inhabitant of the woods responded at regular intervals to the goose, as if determined to expose and disgrace this intruder from Hudson's Bay by exhibiting a greater compass and volume of voice in a native, and boo-hoo him out of Concord horizon. What do you mean by alarming the citadel at this time of night consecrated to me? Do you think I am ever caught napping at such an hour, and that I have not got lungs and a larynx as well as yourself? Boo-hoo! 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 It was one of the most thrilling discords I ever heard. And yet, if you had a discriminating ear, there were in it the elements of a concord such as these plains never saw nor heard. I also heard the whooping of the ice in the pond, my great bedfellow in that part of Concord, 
as if it were restless in its bed and would fain turn over, were troubled with flatulency and had dreams, or I was waked by the cracking of the ground by the frost, as if someone had driven a team against my door, and in the morning would find a crack in the earth a quarter of a mile long and a third of an inch wide. Sometimes I heard the foxes as they ranged over the snow crust in moonlight nights, in search of a partridge or other game, barking raggedly and demoniacally like forest dogs, as if laboring with some anxiety, or seeking expression, struggling for light, and to be dogs outright and run freely in the streets. For if we take the ages into our account, may there not be a civilization going on among brutes as well as men? They seem to me to be rudimental, burrowing men, still standing on their defense, awaiting their transformation. Sometimes one came near to my window, attracted by my light, barked a vulpine curse at me, and then retreated. Usually the red squirrel. Sirius Hudsonius waked me in the dawn, coursing over the roof and up and down the sides of the house, as if sent out of the woods for this purpose. In the course of the winter I threw out half a bushel of ears of sweet corn which had not got ripe, on to the snow-crust by my door, and was amused by watching the motions of the various animals which were baited by it. In the twilight and the night the rabbits came regularly, and made a hearty meal. All day long the red squirrels came and went, and afforded me much entertainment by their maneuvers. One would approach at first warily, through the shrub oaks, running over the snow-crust by fits and starts like a leaf blown by the wind, now a few paces this way, with wonderful speed and waste of energy, making inconceivable haste with his trotters, as if it were for a wager. And now as many paces that way, but never getting on more than half a rod at a time, and then suddenly pausing with a ludicrous expression and a gratuitous somerset, as if all the eyes in the universe were eyed on him. For all the motions of a squirrel, even in the most solitary recesses of the forest, imply spectators as much as those of a dancing girl, wasting more time in delay and circumspection than would have sufficed to walk the whole distance. I never saw one walk, and then suddenly, before you could say Jack Robinson, he would be in the top of a young pitch-pine winding up his clock and chiding all imaginary spectators, soliloquizing and talking to all the universe at the same time, for no reason that I could ever detect, or he himself was aware of, I suspect. At length he would reach the corn, and selecting a suitable ear, frisk about in the same uncertain trigonometrical way to the topmost stick of my woodpile before my window, where he looked me in the face, and there sit for hours, supplying himself with a new ear from time to time, nibbling at first voraciously, and throwing the half-naked cobs about, till at length he grew more dainty still, and played with his food, tasting only the inside of the kernel and the ear, which was held balanced over the stick by one paw, slipping from his careless grasp and fell to the ground, when he would look over at it with a ludicrous expression of uncertainty, as if suspecting that it had life, with a mind not made up whether to get it again, or a new one, or be off. Now thinking of corn, then listening to hear what was in the wind. So the little impudent fellow would waste many an ear in a forenoon, till at last, seizing some longer and plumper one, considerably bigger than himself, and skilfully balancing it, he would set out with it to the woods, like a tiger with a buffalo, by the same zigzag course and frequent pauses, scratching along with it as if it were too heavy for him, and falling all the while, 
making its fall a diagonal between a perpendicular and horizontal, being determined to put it through at any rate. A singularly frivolous and whimsical fellow, and so he would get off with it to where he lived, perhaps carry it to the top of a pine tree forty or fifty rods distant, and I would afterwards find the cobs strewn about the woods in various directions. At length the jays arrive, whose discordant screams were heard long before, as they were warily making their approach an eighth of a mile off, and in a stealthy and sneaking manner they flit from tree to tree, nearer and nearer, and pick up the kernels which the squirrels have dropped. Then, sitting on a pitch-pine bough, they attempt to swallow in their haste a kernel which is too big for their throats and chokes them, and after great labor they disgorge it, and spend an hour in the endeavor to crack it by repeated blows with their bills. They were manifestly thieves, and I had not much respect for them, but the squirrels, though at first shy, went to work as if they were taking what was their own. Meanwhile also came the chickadees in flocks, which, picking up the crumbs the squirrels had dropped, flew to the nearest twig, and placing them under their claws, hammered away at them with their little bills, as if it were an insect in the bark, till they were sufficiently reduced for their slender throats. A little flock of these titmice came daily to pick a dinner out of my woodpile, or the crumbs at my door, with faint flitting lisping notes, like the tinkling of icicles in the grass, or else with sprightly day, 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 or more rarely in spring-like days, a wiry, summery Phoebe from the woodside. They were so familiar that, at length, one alighted on an armful of wood which I was carrying in and pecked at the sticks without fear. I once had a sparrow alight upon my shoulder for a moment while I was hoeing in a village garden, and I felt that I was more distinguished by that circumstance than I should have been by any epaulet I could have worn. The squirrels also grew at last to be quite familiar, and occasionally stepped upon my shoe, when that was the nearest way. When the ground was not yet quite covered, and again near the end of winter, when the snow was melted on my south hillside and about my woodpile, the partridges came out of the woods morning and evening to feed there. Whichever side you walk in the woods, the partridge bursts away on whirring wings, jarring the snow from the dry leaves and twigs on high, which comes sifting down in the sunbeams like golden dust. For this brave bird is not to be scared by winter. It is frequently covered up by drifts, and, it is said, sometimes plunges from on wing into the soft snow, where it remains concealed for a day or two. I used to start them in the open land also, where they had come out of the woods at sunset to bud the wild apple trees. They will come regularly every evening to particular trees, where the cunning sportsman lies in wait for them, and the distant orchards next to the woods suffer thus not a little. I am glad that the partridge gets fed, at any rate. It is nature's own bird which lives on buds and diet drink. In dark winter mornings, or in short winter afternoons, I sometimes heard a pack of hounds threading all the woods with hounding cry and yelp, unable to resist the instinct of the chase and the note of the hunting-horn at intervals, proving that man was in the rear. The woods ring again, and yet no fox bursts forth on to the open level of the pond, nor following pack pursuing their acteon. And perhaps at evening I see the hunters returning with a single brush trailing from their sleigh for a trophy, seeking their inn. 
they tell me that if the fox would remain in the bosom of the frozen earth he would be safe or if b would run in a straight line away no foxhound could overtake him but having left his pursuers far behind he stops to rest and listen till they come up and when he runs he circles round to his old haunts where the hunters await him sometimes however he will run upon a wall many rods and then leap off far to one side and he appears to know that water will not retain his scent a hunter told me that he once saw a fox pursued by hounds burst out onto walden when the ice was covered with shallow puddles run part way across and then returned to the same shore. Ere long the hounds arrived, but here they lost the scent. Sometimes a pack, hunting by themselves, would pass my door, and circle round my house and yelp and hound without regarding me, as if afflicted by a species of madness, so that nothing could divert them from the pursuit. Thus they circle until they fall upon the recent trail of a fox for a wise hound will forsake everything else for this. One day a man came to my hut from Lexington to inquire after his hound, that made a large track, and had been hunting for a week by himself. But I fear that he was not the wiser for all I told him, for every time I attempted to answer his questions he interrupted me by asking, What do you do here? He had lost a dog, but found a man. One old hunter, who has a dry tongue, who used to come to bathe in Walden once every year when the water was warmest, and at such times looked in upon me, told me that many years ago he took his gun one afternoon and went out for a cruise in Walden Wood, and as he walked the Wayland Road he heard the cry of hounds approaching, and ere long a fox leaped the wall into the road, and as quick as thought leaped the other wall out of the road, and his swift bullet had not touched him. Some way behind came an old hound and her three pups in full pursuit, hunting on their own accord, and disappeared again in the woods. Late in the afternoon, as he was resting in the thick woods south of Walden, he heard the voice of the hounds far over toward Fair Haven, still pursuing the fox. And on they came, their hounding cry which made all the woods ring, sounding nearer and nearer, now from Well Meadow, now from the Baker Farm. For a long time he stood still and listened to their music, so sweet to a hunter's ear, when suddenly the fox appeared, threading the solemn aisles with an easy coursing pace, whose sound was concealed by a sympathetic rustle of the leaves swift and still, keeping the round, leaving his pursuers far behind, and leaping upon a rock amid the woods, he sat erect and listening, with his back to the hunter. For a moment compassion restrained the latter's arm, but that was a short-lived mood, and as quick as thought can follow thought his piece was leveled and whang! The fox, rolling over the rock, lay dead on the ground. The hunter still kept his place and listened to the hounds. Still on they came, and now the near woods resounded through all their aisles with their demoniac cry. At length the old hound burst into view with muzzle to the ground, and snapping the air as if possessed, and ran directly to the rock. But spying the dead fox, she suddenly ceased her hounding, as if struck dumb with amazement, and walked round and round him in silence. And one by one her pups arrived, and like their mother, were sobered into silence by the mystery. Then the hunter came forward and stood in their midst, and the mystery was solved. They waited in silence while he skinned the fox, then followed the brush a while, and at length turned off into the woods again. That evening a Weston squire came to the Concord hunter's cottage to inquire for his hounds, and told how for a week they had been hunting on their own account from Weston woods. 
the Concord hunter told him what he knew and offered him the skin, but the other declined it and departed. He did not find his hounds that night, but the next day learned that they had crossed the river and put up at a farmhouse for the night, whence, having been well fed, they took their departure early in the morning. The hunter who told me this could remember one Sam Nutting, who used to hunt bears on Fairhaven ledges and exchange their skins for rum in Concord Village, who told him even that he had seen a moose there. Nutting had a famous foxhound named Burgoyne. He pronounced it Bogeen, which my informant used to borrow. In the Wast Book of an old trader of this town, who was also a captain, town clerk, and representative, I find the following entry. January 18, 1742, 43. John Melvin, credited by one, Gray Fox, zero, two, three. They are not now found here, and in his ledger, February 7, 1743, Hezekiah Stratton has credit by one half a cat skin zero one four plus. Of course, a wild cat, for Stratton was a sergeant in the old French war, and would not have got credit for hunting less noble game. Credit is given for deer skins also, and they were daily sold. One man still preserves the horns of the last deer that was killed in this vicinity, and another has told me the particulars of the hunt in which his uncle was engaged. The hunters were formerly a numerous and merry crew here. I remember well one gaunt nimrod who would catch up a leaf by the roadside and play a strain on it, wilder and more melodious, if my memory serves me, than any hunting horn. At midnight, when there was a moon, I sometimes met with hounds in my path prowling about the woods, which would skulk out of my way, as if afraid, and stand silent amid the bushes till I had passed. Squirrels and wild mice disputed for my store of nuts. There were scores of pitch pines around my house, from one to four inches in diameter, which had been gnawed by mice the previous winter a Norwegian winter for them, for the snow lay long and deep, and they were obliged to mix a large proportion of pine bark with their other diet. These trees were alive and apparently flourishing at midsummer, and many of them had grown a foot, though completely girdled, but after another winter such were without exception dead. It is remarkable that a single mouse should thus be allowed a whole pine tree for its dinner, gnawing round instead of up and down it. But perhaps it is necessary in order to thin these trees, which are wont to grow up densely. The hares, Lepus americanus, were very familiar. One had her form under my house all winter, separated from me only by the flooring, and she startled me each morning by her hasty departure when I began to stir. Thump, thump, thump! striking her head against the floor timbers in her hurry. They used to come round my door at dusk to nibble the potato parings which I had thrown out, and were so nearly the colour of the ground that they could hardly be distinguished when still. Sometimes in the twilight I alternately lost and recovered sight of one, sitting motionless under my window. When I opened my door in the evening off they would go with a squeak and a bounce, Near at hand they only excited my pity. One evening one sat by my door two paces from me, at first trembling with fear, yet unwilling to move. A poor wee thing, lean and bony, with ragged ears and sharp nose, scant tail and slender paws. It looked as if nature no longer contained the breed of nobler bloods but stood on her last toes. Its large eyes appeared young and unhealthy, almost dropsical. I took a step, 
and lo, away it scud with an elastic spring over the snow-crust, straightening its body and its limbs into graceful length, and soon put the forest between me and itself. The wild free venison, asserting its vigor and the dignity of nature. Not without reason was its slenderness. Such, then, was its nature. Lepus, levipus, light foot, methinks. What is a country without rabbits and partridges? They are among the most simple and indigenous animal products. Ancient and venerable families, known to antiquity as to modern times, of the very hue and substance of nature, nearest allied to leaves and to the ground and to one another. It is either winged or it is legged. It is hardly as if you had seen a wild creature when a rabbit or a partridge bursts away, only a natural one, as much to be expected as rustling leaves. The partridge and the rabbit are still sure to thrive like true natives of the soil, whatever revolutions occur. If the forest is cut off, the sprouts and bushes which spring up afford them concealment, and they become more numerous than ever. That must be a poor country indeed that does not support a hare. Our woods teem with them both, and around every swamp may be seen the partridge or rabbit walk, beset with twiggy fences and horse-hair snares which some cowboy tends. End of chapter 15This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Walden by Henry David Thoreau The Pond in Winter Chapter 16 After a still night I awoke with the impression that some question had been put to me, which I had been endeavoring in vain to answer in my sleep, as what, how, when, where. But there was dawning nature, in whom all creatures live, looking in at my broad windows, with serene and satisfied face and no question on her lips. I awoke to an answered question, to nature and daylight, the snow lying deep on the earth dotted with young pines, and the very slope of the hill on which my house is placed seemed to say, Forward. Nature puts no question and answers, none which we mortals ask. She has long ago taken her resolution. O oh, Prince, our eyes contemplate with admiration and transmit to the soul the wonderful and varied spectacle of this universe. The night veils without doubt a part of this glorious creation, but day comes to reveal to us this great work, which extends from earth even into the plains of the ether. Then to my morning work. First I take an axe and pail and go in search of water, if that be not a dream. After a cold and snowy night it needed a divining rod to find it. Every winter the liquid and trembling surface of the pond, which was so sensitive to every breath, and reflected every light and shadow, becomes solid to the depth of a foot or a foot and a half, so that it will support the heaviest teams, and perchance the snow covers it to an equal depth, and it is not to be distinguished from any level field. Like the marmots in the surrounding hills, it closes its eyelids and becomes dormant for three months or more. Standing on the snow-covered plain as if in a pasture amid the hills, I cut my way first through a foot of snow and then a foot of ice, and open a window under my feet, where, kneeling to drink, I look down into the quiet parlor of the fishes, pervaded by 
a softening light as through a window of ground glass, with its bright sanded floor the same as in summer. There a perennial waveless serenity reigns as in the amber twilight sky, corresponding to the cool and even temperament of the inhabitants. Heaven is under our feet as well as over our heads. Early in the morning, while all things are crisp with frost, men come with fishing reels in slender lunch, and let down their fine lines through the snowy field to take pickerel and perch. Wild men, who instinctively follow other fashions and trust other authorities than their townsmen, and by their goings and comings stitch towns together in parts where else they would be ripped. They sit and eat their luncheon in stout fear knots on the dry oak leaves on the shore, as wise in local lore as the citizen is in artificial. They never consulted with books, and know and can tell much less than they have done. The things which they practice are said not yet to be known. Here is one fishing for pickerel with grown perch for bait. You look into his pail with wonder as into a summer pond, as if he kept summer locked up at home or knew where she had retreated. How, pray, did he get these in midwinter? Oh, he got worms out of rotten logs since the ground froze, and so he caught them. His life itself passes deeper in nature than the studies of the naturalist penetrate, himself a subject for the naturalist. The latter raises the moss and bark gently with his knife in search of insects, the former lays open logs to their core with his axe, and moss and bark fly far and wide. He gets his living by barking trees. Such a man has some right to fish, and I love to see nature carried out in him. The perch swallows the grubworm, the pickerel swallows the perch, and the fisherman swallows the pickerel, and so all the chinks in the scale of being are filled. When I strolled around the pond in misty weather, I was sometimes amused by the primitive mode which some ruder fisherman had adopted. He would perhaps have placed alder branches over the narrow holes in the ice, which were four or five rods apart and an equal distance from the shore, and having fastened the end of the line to a stick to prevent it being pulled through, have passed the slack line over a twig of the alder, a foot or more above the ice, and tied a dry oak leaf to it, which being pulled down, would show when he had a bite. These alders loomed through the mist at regular intervals as you walked halfway around the pond. Ah, the pickerel of Walden, when I see them lying on the ice or in the well which the fisherman cuts in the ice, making a little hole to admit the water, I am always surprised by their rare beauty, as if they were fabulous fishes. They are so foreign to the streets, even to the woods foreign as Arabia to our Concord life. They possess a quite dazzling and transcendent beauty, which separates them by a wide interval from the cadaverous cod and haddock whose fame is trumpeted in our streets. They are not green like the pines, nor gray like the stones, nor blue like the sky, but they have to my eyes, if possible, yet rarer colors, like flowers and precious stones, as if they were the pearls, the animalized nuclei or crystals of the Walden water. They, of course, are Walden all over and all through, are themselves small Waldens in the animal kingdom, Waldenses. It is surprising that they are caught here, that in this deep and capacious spring far beneath the rattling teams and chaises and tinkling sleighs that travel the Walden Road, this great gold and emerald fish swims. I never chanced to see its kind in any market, 
it would be the sinecure of all eyes there. Easily, with a few convulsive quirks, they give up their watery ghosts, like a mortal translated before his time to the thin air of heaven. As I was desirous to recover the long-lost bottom of Walden Pond, I surveyed it carefully before the ice broke up, early in forty-six, with compass and chain and sounding line. There have been many stories told about the bottom, or rather no bottom of this pond, which certainly had no foundation for themselves. It is remarkable how long men will believe in the bottomlessness of a pond without taking the trouble to sound it. I have visited two such bottomless ponds in one walk in this neighborhood. Many have believed that Walden reached quite through to the other side of the globe. Some who have lain flat on the ice for a long time looking down through the elusive medium, perchance with watery eyes into the bargain, and driven to hasty conclusions by the fear of catching cold in their breasts, have seen vast holes into which a load of hay might be driven, if there were anybody to drive it, the undoubted source of the Styx, and entrance to the infernal regions from these parts. Others have gone down from the village with a fifty-six and a wagon-load of inch rope, but yet have failed to find any bottom. For, while the fifty-six was resting, by the way, they were paying out the rope in the vain attempt to fathom their truly immeasurable capacity for marvelousness. But I can assure my readers that Walden has a reasonably tight bottom at a not unreasonable, though at an unusual depth. I fathomed it easily with a cod line and a stone, weighing about a pound and a half, and could tell accurately when the stone left the bottom, by having to pull so much harder before the water got underneath to help me. The greatest depth was exactly one hundred and two feet, to which may be added the five feet which it has risen since, making one hundred and seven. This is a remarkable depth for so small an area, yet not an inch of it can be spared by the imagination. What if all ponds were shallow? Would it not react on the minds of men? I am thankful that this pond was made deep and pure for a symbol. While men believe in the infinite, some ponds will be thought to be bottomless. A factory owner, hearing what depth I had found, thought that it could not be true, for judging from his acquaintance with dams, sand would not lie at so steep an angle. But the deepest ponds are not so deep in proportion to their area, as most suppose, and if drained would not leave very remarkable valleys. They are not like cups between the hills. For this one, which is so unusually deep for its area, appears in a vertical section through its center not deeper than a shallow plate. Most ponds emptied would leave a meadow no more hollow than we frequently see. William Gilpin, who is so admirable in all that relates to landscapes, and usually so correct, standing at the head of Loch Fyne in Scotland, which he describes as a bay of salt water sixty or seventy fathoms deep, four miles in breadth, and about fifty miles long, surrounded by mountains, observes, If we could have seen it immediately after the diluvian crash, or whatever convulsion of nature occasioned it, before the waters gushed in, what a horrid chasm must it have appeared! So high as heaved the tumid hills, so low down sunk a hollow bottom broad and deep, capacious bed of waters. But if, using the shortest diameter of Loch Fine, we apply these proportions to Walden, which, as we have seen, appears already in a vertical section only like a shallow plate, it will appear four times as shallow. So much for the increased horrors of the chasm of Loch Fine when emptied. No doubt many a smiling valley with its stretching cornfields occupies exactly such a horrid chasm, from which the waters have receded, 
though it requires the insight and the far-sight of the geologist to convince the unsuspecting inhabitant of this fact. Often an inquisitive eye may detect the shores of a primitive lake in the low horizon hills, and no subsequent elevation of the plain have been necessary to conceal their history. But it is easiest, as they who work on the highways know, to find the hollows by the puddles after a shower. The amount of it is, the imagination give it the least license, dives deeper, and soars higher than nature goes. So probably the depth of the ocean will be found to be very inconsiderable compared with its breadth. As I sounded through the ice I could determine the shape of the bottom with greater accuracy than is possible in surveying harbors which do not freeze over, and I was surprised at its general regularity. In the deepest part there are several acres more level than almost any field which is exposed to the sun, wind, and plough. In one instance, on a line arbitrarily chosen, the depth did not vary more than one foot in thirty rods, and generally, near the middle, I could calculate the variation for each one hundred feet in any direction beforehand within three or four inches. Some are accustomed to speak of the deep and dangerous holes even in quiet sandy ponds like this, but the effect of water under these circumstances is to level all inequalities. The regularity of the bottom and its conformity to the shores and the range of the neighboring hills were so perfect that a distant promontory betrayed itself in the soundings, quite across the pond, and its direction could be determined by observing the opposite shore. Cape becomes bar, and plain shoal, and valley and gorge, deep water and channel. When I had mapped the pond by the scale of ten rods to an inch, and put down the soundings, more than a hundred in all, I observed this remarkable coincidence. Having noticed that the number indicating the greatest depth was apparently in the center of the map, I laid a rule on the map lengthwise and then breadthwise, and found, to my surprise, that the line of greatest length intersected the line of greatest breadth exactly at the point of greatest depth. Notwithstanding that the middle is so nearly level, the outline of the pond far from regular, and the extreme length and breadth were got by measuring into the coves. And I said to myself, who knows but this hint would conduct to the deepest part of the ocean as well as of a pond or puddle. Is not this the rule also for the height of mountains, regarded as the opposite of valleys? We know that a hill is not highest at its narrowest part. Of five coves, three, or all which had been sounded, were observed to have a bar quite across their mouths and deeper water within, so that the bay tended to be an expansion of water within the land not only horizontally but vertically and to form a basin or independent pond, the direction of the two capes showing the course of the bar. Every harbor on the sea coast also has its bar at its entrance. In proportion as the mouth of the cove was wider compared with its length, the water over the bar was deeper compared with that in the basin. Given then the length and breadth of the cove and the character of the surrounding shore, and you have almost elements enough to make out a formula for all cases. In order to see how nearly I could guess, with this experience, at the deepest point in a pond, by observing the outlines of a surface and the character of its shores alone, I made a plan of white pond, which contains about forty-one acres, and, like this, has no island in it, nor any visible inlet or outlet. And as the line of greatest breadth fell very near the line of least breadth, where two opposite capes approached each other and two opposite bays receded, I ventured to mark a point a short distance from the latter line, but still on the line of greatest length, as the deepest. The deepest part was found to be within one hundred feet of this, still farther in the direction to which I had inclined, 
and was only one foot deeper, namely sixty feet. Of course, a stream running through or an island in the pond would make the problem much more complicated. If we knew all the laws of nature, we should need only one fact, or the description of one actual phenomenon, to infer all the particular results at that point. Now we know only a few laws, and our result is vitiated, not of course by any confusion or irregularity in nature, but by our ignorance of essential elements in the calculation. Our notions of law and harmony are commonly confined to those instances which we detect, but the harmony which results from a far greater number of seemingly conflicting but really concurring laws, which we have not detected, is still more wonderful. The particular laws are as our points of view, as to the traveler, a mountain outline varies with each step, and it has an infinite number of profiles, though absolutely but one form. Even when cleft or bored through, it is not comprehended in its entireness. What I have observed of the pond is no less true in ethics. It is the law of average. Such a rule of the two diameters not only guides us toward the sun in the system and the heart in man, but draws lines through the length and breadth of the aggregate of a man's particular daily behaviors and waves of life into his coves and inlets, and where they intersect will be the height or depth of his character. Perhaps we need only to know how his shores trend and his adjacent country or circumstances to infer his depth and concealed bottom. If he is surrounded by mountainous circumstances, an Achillean shore whose peaks overshadow and are reflected in his bosom, they suggest a corresponding depth in him. But a low and smooth shore proves him shallow on that side. In our bodies, a bold projecting brow falls off to and indicates a corresponding depth of thought. Also there is a bar across the entrance of our every cove, or particular inclination. Each is our harbor for a season, in which we are detained and partially landlocked. These inclinations are not whimsical usually, but their form, size, and direction are determined by the promontories of the shore, the ancient axes of elevation. When this bar is gradually increased by storms, tides, or currents, or there is a subsidence of the waters, so that it reaches to the surface, that which was at first but an inclination in the shore, in which a thought was harbored, becomes an individual lake cut off from the ocean, wherein the thought secures its own conditions, changes perhaps from salt to fresh, becomes a sweet sea, dead sea, or a marsh. At the advent of each individual into this life, may we not suppose that such a bar has risen to the surface somewhere? It is true. We are such poor navigators that our thoughts, for the most part, stand off and on upon a harborless coast, are conversant only with the bites of the bays of poesy, or steer for the public ports of entry, and go into the dry docks of science, where they merely refit for this world, and no natural currents concur to individualize them. As for the inlet or outlet of Walden, I have not discovered any but rain and snow and evaporation, though perhaps with a thermometer and a line such places may be found, for where the water flows into the pond it will probably be coldest in summer and warmest in winter. When the ice men were at work here in 46-47, the cakes sent to the shore were one day rejected by those who were stacking them up there 
not being thick enough to lie side by side with the rest, and the cutters thus discovered that the ice over a small space was two or three inches thinner than elsewhere, which made them think that there was an inlet there. They also showed me in another place what they thought was a leech hole, through which the pond leaked out under a hill into a neighboring meadow, pushing me out on a cake of ice to see it. It was a small cavity under ten feet of water, but I think that I can warrant the pond not to need soldering till they find a worse leak than that. One has suggested that if such a leech hole should be found, its connection with the meadow, if any existed, might be proved by conveying some colored powder or sawdust to the mouth of the hole, and then putting a strainer over the spring in the meadow, which would catch some of the particles carried through by the current. While I was surveying, the ice, which was sixteen inches thick, undulated under a slight wind like water. It is well known that a level cannot be used on ice. At one rod from the shore its greatest fluctuation, when observed by means of a level on land directed toward a graduated staff on the ice, was three-quarters of an inch, though the ice appeared firmly attached to the shore. It was probably greater in the middle. Who knows but if our instruments were delicate enough we might not detect an undulation in the crust of the earth. When two legs of my level were on the shore and the third on the ice, and the sights were directed over the latter, a rise or fall of the ice of an almost infinitesimal amount made a difference of several feet on a tree across the pond. When I began to cut holes for sounding, there were three or four inches of water on the ice under a deep snow which had sunk it thus far, but the water began immediately to run into these holes, and continued to run for two days in deep streams which wore away the ice on every side, and contributed essentially, if not mainly, to dry the surface of the pond for as the water ran in it raised and floated the ice. This was somewhat like cutting a hole in the bottom of a ship to let the water out. When such holes freeze, and a rain succeeds, and finally a new freezing forms a fresh smooth ice over all, it is beautifully mottled internally by dark figures, shaped somewhat like a spider's web, what you may call ice rosettes produced by the channels worn by the water flowing from all sides to a center. Sometimes also, when the ice was covered with shallow puddles, I saw a double shadow of myself, one standing on the head of the other, one on the ice, the other on the trees or hillside. While yet it is cold January, and snow and ice are thick and solid, the prudent landlord comes from the village to get ice to cool his summer drink impressively, even pathetically wise to foresee the heat and thirst of July now in January, wearing a thick coat and mittens, when so many things are not provided for. It may be that he lays up no treasures in this world which will cool his summer drink in the next. He cuts and saws the solid pool, unroofs the house of the fishes, and carts off their very element and air, held fast by chains and stakes like corded wood, through the favoring winter air to wintry cellars, to underlie the summer there. It looks like solidified azure, as far off it is drawn through the streets. These ice-cutters are a merry race, full of jest and sport, and when I went among them they were wont to invite me to saw pit fashion with them, I standing underneath. In the winter of forty-six, forty-seven, there came a hundred men of hyperborean extraction swooping down on to our pond one morning with many carloads of ungainly-looking farming tools, sleds, plows, drill barrows, turf knives, spades, saws, rakes, and each man was armed with a double-pointed pike-staff, 
such as is not described in the New England farmer or the cultivator. I did not know whether they had come to sow a crop of winter rye, or some other kind of grain recently introduced from Iceland. As I saw no manure I judged that they meant to skim the land, as I had done, thinking the soil was deep and had lain fallow long enough. They said that a gentleman farmer who was behind the scenes wanted to double his money, which as I understood amounted to half a million already, but in order to cover each one of his dollars with another, he took off the only coat, aye, the skin itself, of Walden Pond, in the midst of a hard winter. They went to work at once, ploughing, barrowing, rolling, furrowing, in admirable order, as if they were bent on making this a model farm. But when I was looking sharp to see what kind of seed they dropped into the furrow, a gang of fellows by my side suddenly began to hook up the virgin mould itself, with a peculiar jerk, clean down to the sand, or rather the water, for it was a very springy soil. Indeed, all the terra firma there was, and haul it away on sleds, and then I guessed that they must be cutting peat in a bog. So they came and went every day, with a peculiar shriek from the locomotive, from and to some point of the polar regions, as it seemed to me, like a flock of arctic snowbirds. But some time Squaw Walden had her revenge, and a hired man walking behind his team slipped through a crack in the ground down toward Tartarus, and he who was so brave before suddenly became but the ninth part of a man, almost gave up his animal heat, and was glad to take refuge in my house, and acknowledged that there was some virtue in a stove, or sometimes the frozen soil took a piece of steel out of a plowshare, or a plow got set in the furrow and had to be cut out. To speak literally, a hundred Irishmen with Yankee overseers came from Cambridge every day to get out the ice. They divided it into cakes by methods too well known to require description, and these being sledded to the shore were rapidly hauled off onto an ice platform, and raised by grappling irons and block and tackle, worked by horses onto a stack, as surely as so many barrels of flour, and there placed evenly side by side and row upon row, as if they formed a solid base of an obelisk designed to pierce the clouds. They told me that in a good day they could get out a thousand tons, which was the yield of about one acre. Deep ruts and cradle-holes were worn in the ice, as on terra firma, by the passage of the sleds over the same track, and the horses invariably ate their oats out of cakes of ice, hollowed out like buckets. They stacked up the cakes thus in the open air in a pile thirty-five feet high on one side, and six or seven rods square, putting hay between the outside layers to exclude the air. For when the wind, though never so cold, finds a passage through, it will wear large cavities, leaving slight supports or studs only here and there, and finally topple it down. At first it looked like a vast blue fort or Valhalla, but when they began to tuck the coarse meadow hay into the crevices, and this became covered with rime and icicles, it looked like a venerable moss-grown and hoary ruin, built of azure-tinted marble, the abode of winter, that old man we see in the almanac, his shanty as if he had a design to estivate with us. They calculated that not twenty-five per cent of this would reach its destination, and that two or three per cent would be wasted in the cars. However, a still greater part of this heap had a different destiny from what was intended. For, either because the ice was found not to keep so well as was expected, containing more air than usual, more for some other reason, it never got to market. 
This heap made in the winter of 46-47 and estimated to contain 10,000 tons was finally covered with hay and boards, and though it was unroofed the following July and a part of it carried off, the rest remained exposed to the sun. It stood over that summer and the next winter, and was not quite melted till September of 1848. Thus the pond recovered the greater part. Like the water, the walled in ice, seen near at hand, has a green tint, but at a distance is beautifully blue, and you can easily tell it from the white ice of the river or the merely greenish ice of some ponds, quarter of a mile off. Sometimes one of these great cakes slips from the ice man's sled into the village street, and lies there for a week like a great emerald, an object of interest to all passers. I have noticed that a portion of Walden, which in the state of water was green, will often, when frozen, appear from the same point of view blue. So the hollows about this pond will, sometimes in the winter, be filled with a greenish water somewhat like its own, but the next day will be frozen blue. Perhaps the blue color of water and ice is due to the light and air they contain, and the most transparent is the bluest. Ice is an interesting subject for contemplation. They told me that they had some ice houses at Fresh Pond, five years old, which was as good as ever. Why is it that a bucket of water soon becomes putrid, but frozen remains sweet forever? It is commonly said that this is the difference between the affections and the intellect. Thus for sixteen days I saw from my window a hundred men at work like busy husbandmen, with teams and horses and apparently all the implements of farming. Such a picture as we see on the first page of the almanac, and as often as I looked out I was reminded of the fable of the lark and the reapers, or the parable of the sower, and the like. And now they are all gone, and in thirty days more, probably, I shall look from the same window on the pure sea-green Walden water there, reflecting the clouds and the trees, and sending up its evaporations in solitude, and no traces will appear that a man has ever stood there. Perhaps I shall hear a solitary loon laugh as he dives and plumes himself, or shall see a lonely fisher in his boat, like a floating leaf, beholding his form reflected in the waves, where lately a hundred men securely labored. Thus it appears that the sweltering inhabitants of Charleston, and New Orleans of Madras and Bombay and Calcutta, drink at my well. In the morning I bathe my intellect in the stupendous and cosmogonal philosophy of the Bhagat Gita, since whose composition years of the gods have elapsed, and in comparison with which our modern world and its literature seem puny and trivial, and I doubt if that philosophy is not to be referred to a previous state of existence. So remote is its sublimity from our conceptions. I lay down the book and go to my well for water, and lo, there I meet the servant of the Brahmin, priest of Brahma and Vishnu and Indra, who still sits in his temple on the Ganges, reading the Vedas, or dwells at the root of a tree with his crust and water jug. I meet his servant come to draw water for his master, and our buckets, as it were, great together in the same well. The pure Walden water is mingled with the sacred water of the Ganges. With favoring winds 
it is wafted past the sight of the fabulous islands of Atlantis and the Hesperides, makes the periplus of Hanno, and floating by Ternate and Tidor and the mouth of the Persian Gulf, melts in the tropic gales of the Indian seas, and is landed in ports of which Alexander only heard the names. End of chapter 16「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 17 Spring the opening of large tracts by the ice-cutters commonly causes a pond to break up earlier, for the water agitated by the wind, even in cold weather, wears away the surrounding ice. But such was not the effect on Walden that year, for she had soon got a thick new garment to take the place of the old. This pond never breaks up so soon as the others in this neighborhood on account both of its greater depth and its having no stream passing through it to melt or wear away the ice. I never knew it to open in the course of a winter, not excepting that of 52-53, which gave the pond so severe a trial. It commonly opens about the first of April, a week or ten days later than Flint's Pond and Fairhaven, beginning to melt on the north side and in the shallower parts where it began to freeze. It indicates better than any water hereabouts the absolute progress of the season, being least affected by transient changes of temperature. A severe cold of a few days' duration in March may very much retard the opening of the former ponds, while the temperature of Walden increases almost uninterruptedly. A thermometer thrust into the middle of Walden on the 6th of March, 1847, stood at 32 degrees, or freezing point, near the shore at 33 degrees, in the middle of Flint's Pond, the same day, at 32 plus degrees, at a dozen rods from the shore, in shallow water under ice a foot thick, at thirty-six degrees. This difference of three and a half degrees between the temperature of the deep water and the shallow in the latter pond, and the fact that a great proportion of it is comparatively shallow, show why it should break up so much sooner than Walden. The ice in the shallowest part was at this time several inches thinner than in the middle. In midwinter the middle had been the warmest and the ice thinnest there. So also every one who has waded about the shores of the pond in summer must have perceived how much warmer the water is close to the shore, where only three or four inches deep, then a little distance out, and on the surface where it is deep, then near the bottom. In spring the sun not only exerts an influence through the increased temperature of the air and earth, but its heat passes through ice a foot or more thick, and is reflected from the bottom in shallow water, and so also warms the water and melts the underside of the ice, at the same time that it is melting it more directly above, making it uneven, and causing the air bubbles which it contains to extend themselves upward and downward until it is comparatively honeycombed, and at last disappears suddenly in a single spring rain. Ice has its grain as well as wood, and when a cake begins to rot or comb, that is, assume the appearance of honeycomb, whatever may be its position, the air cells are at right angles 
with what was the water surface. Where there is a rock or a log rising near to the surface, the ice over it is much thinner, and is frequently quite dissolved by this reflected heat. And I have been told that in the experiment at Cambridge to freeze water in a shallow wooden pond, through the cold air circulating underneath, and so had access to both sides, the reflection of the sun from the bottom more than counterbalanced this advantage. When a warm rain in the middle of the winter melts off the snow ice from Walden, and leaves a hard, dark, or transparent ice on the middle, there will be a strip of rotten, though thicker, white ice, a rod or more wide, about the shores, created by this reflected heat. Also, as I have said, the bubbles themselves within the ice operate as burning glasses to melt the ice beneath. The phenomena of the year take place every day in a pond on a small scale. Every morning, generally speaking, the shallow water is being warmed more rapidly than the deep, though it may not be made so warm after all, and every evening it is being cooled more rapidly until the morning. The day is an epitome of the year. The night is the winter. The morning and evening are the spring and fall, and the noon is the summer. The cracking and booming of the ice indicate a change of temperature. One pleasant morning after a cold night, February 24, 1850, having gone to Flint's Pond to spend the day, I noticed with surprise that when I struck the ice with the head of my axe, it resounded like a gong for many rods around, or as if I had struck on a tight drumhead. The pond began to boom about an hour after sunrise, when it felt the influence of the sun's rays slanted upon it from over the hills. It stretched itself and yawned like a waking man with a gradually increasing tumult, which was kept up three or four hours. It took a short siesta at noon, and boomed once more toward night as the sun was withdrawing its influence. In the right stage of the weather a pond fires its evening gun with great regularity. But in the middle of the day, being full of cracks, and the air also being less elastic, it had completely lost its resonance, and probably fishes and muskrats could not then have been stunned by a blow on it. The fishermen say that the thundering of the pond scares the fishes and prevents their biting. The pond does not thunder every evening, and I cannot tell surely when to expect its thundering. But though I may perceive no difference in the weather, it does. Who would have suspected so large and cold and thick-skinned a thing to be so sensitive? Yet it has its law, to which it thunders obedience when it should, as surely as the buds expand in the spring. The earth is all alive, and covered with papillae. The largest pond is as sensitive to atmospheric changes as the globule of mercury in its tube. One attraction in coming to the woods to live was that I should have leisure and opportunity to see the spring come in. The ice in the pond at length begins to be honeycombed, and I can set my heel in it as I walk. Fogs and rains and warmer suns are gradually melting the snow. The days have grown sensibly longer, and I see how I shall get through the winter without adding to my woodpile, for large fires are no longer necessary. I am on the alert for the first signs of spring, to hear the chance note of some arriving bird, or the striped squirrel's chirp, for his stores must be now nearly exhausted, or see the woodchuck venture out of his winter quarters. On the 13th of March, after I had heard the bluebird, 
song sparrow and red wing, the ice was still nearly a foot thick. As the weather grew warmer, it was not sensibly worn away by the water, nor broken up and floated off as in rivers, but though it was completely melted for half a rod in width about the shore, the middle was merely honeycombed and saturated with water, so that you could put your foot through it when six inches thick. But by the next day evening, perhaps, after a warm rain followed by fog, it would have wholly disappeared, all gone off with the fog, spirited away. One year I went across the middle only five days before it disappeared entirely. In 1845 Walden was first comparatively open on the 1st of April. In 46 the 25th of March. In 47 the 8th of April. In 51 the 28th of March. In 52 the 18th of April. In 53 the 23rd of March. In 54 about the 7th of April. Every incident connected with the breaking up of the rivers and ponds and the settling of the weather is particularly interesting to us who live in a climate of so great extremes. When the warmer days come, they who dwell near the river hear the ice crack at night with a startling whoop as loud as artillery as if its icy fetters were rent from end to end, and within a few days see it rapidly going out. So the alligator comes out of the mud with quakings of the earth. One old man, who has been a close observer of nature, and seems as thoroughly wise in regard to all her operations as if she had been put upon the stocks when he was a boy, he had helped to lay her keel, who has come to his growth and can hardly acquire more of natural lore if he should live to the age of Methuselah, told me, and I was surprised to hear him express wonder at any of nature's operations, for I thought that there were no secrets between them, that one spring day he took his gun and boat and thought that he would have a little sport with the ducks. There was ice still on the meadows, but it was all gone out of the river, and he dropped down without obstruction from Sudbury, where he lived, to Fairhaven Pond, which he found unexpectedly covered for the most part with a firm field of ice. It was a warm day, and he was surprised to see so great a body of ice remaining. Not seeing any ducks, he hid his boat on the north or back side of an island, in the pond, and then concealed himself in the bushes on the south side, to await them. The ice was melted for three or four rods from the shore, and there was a smooth and warm sheet of water, with a muddy bottom, such as the ducks love, within, and he thought it likely, that some would be along pretty soon. After he had lain still there about an hour, he heard a low and seemingly very distant sound but singularly grand and impressive, unlike anything he had ever heard, gradually swelling and increasing as if it would have a universal and memorable ending, a sullen rush and roar, which seemed to him all at once like the sound of a vast body of fowl coming in to settle there, and seizing his gun he started up in haste and excited but he found to his surprise that the whole body of the ice had started while he lay there and drifted into the shore, and the sound he had heard was made by its edge grating on the shore, at first gently nibbled and crumbled off, but at length heaving up and scattering its wrecks along the island to a considerable height before it came to a standstill. At length the sun's rays have attained the right angle, and warm winds blow up mist and rain and melt the snow banks, and the sun dispersing the mist smiles on a checkered landscape of russet and white smoking with incense. 
through which the traveler picks his way from islet to islet, cheered by the music of a thousand tinkling rills and rivulets whose veins are filled with the blood of winter which they are bearing off. Few phenomena gave me more delight to observe the forms which thawing sand and clay assume in flowing down the sides of a deep cut on the railroad through which I passed on my way to the village. A phenomenon not very common on so large a scale, though the number of freshly exposed banks of the right material must have been greatly multiplied since railroads were invented. The material was sand of every degree of fineness, and of rich colors commonly mixed with a little clay. When the frost comes out in the spring, and even in a thawing day in the winter, the sand begins to flow down the slopes like lava, sometimes bursting out through the snow and overflowing it, where no sand was to be seen before. Innumerable little streams overlap and interlace one with another, exhibiting a sort of hybrid product, which obeys halfway the law of currents and halfway that of vegetation. As it flows, it takes the form of sappy leaves or vines, making heaps of pulpy sprays a foot or more in depth, and resembling, as you look down on them, the laciniated, lobed, and imbrigated thalluses of some lichens. Or you are reminded of coral, of leopards' paws or birds' feet of brains or lungs or bowels and excrements of all kinds. It is a truly grotesque vegetation, whose form and color we see imitated in bronze, a sort of architectural foliage more ancient and typical than acanthus, chicory, ivy, vine, or any vegetable leaves, destined perhaps under some circumstances to become a puzzle to future geologists. The whole cut impressed me as if it were a cave with its stalactites laid open to the light. The various shades of the sand are singularly rich and agreeable, embracing the different iron colors, brown, gray, yellowish, and reddish. When the flowing mass reaches the drain at the foot of the bank, it spreads out flatter into strands, the separate streams losing their semi-cylindrical form, and gradually becoming more flat and broad, running together as they are more moist till they form an almost flat sand, still variously beautifully shaded, but in which you can trace the original forms of vegetation, till at length, in the water itself, they are converted into banks like those formed off the mouths of rivers, and the forms of vegetation are lost in the ripple marks on the bottom. The whole bank, which is from twenty to forty feet high, is sometimes overlaid with a mass of this kind of foliage, or sandy rupture, for a quarter of a mile on one or both sides, the produce of one spring day. What makes this sand foliage remarkable is its springing into existence thus suddenly, when I see on the one side the inert bank, for the sun acts on one side first, and on the other this luxuriant foliage and the creation of an hour, I am affected as if in a peculiar sense I stood in the laboratory of the artist who made the world and me, had come to where he was still at work, sporting on this bank and with excess of energy strewing his fresh designs about. I feel as if I were nearer to the vitals of the globe, for this sandy overflow is something such a foliaceous mass as the vitals of the animal body. You find thus in the very sands an anticipation of the vegetable leaf, no wonder that the earth expresses itself outwardly in leaves. It so labors the idea inwardly. 
the atoms have already learned this law and are pregnant by it the overhanging leaf sees here its prototype internally whether in the globe or animal body it is a moist thick lobe a word especially applicable to the liver and lungs and the leaves of fat jnai labor lapsus to flow or slip downward a lapsing gyas globus lobe globe also lap flap and other words externally a dry thin leaf even as the f and v are a pressed and dried b the radicals of lobe are lb the soft mass of the b single lobed or b double lobed with the liquid l behind it pressing it forward in globe glub the guttural g adds to the meaning the capacity of the throat the feathers and wings of birds are still drier and thinner leaves thus also you pass from the lumpish grub in the earth to the airy and fluttering butterfly the very globe continually transcends and translates itself and becomes winged in its orbit even ice begins with delicate crystal leaves as if it had flowed into molds which the fronds of water plants have impressed on the watery mirror the whole tree itself is but one leaf and rivers are still vaster leaves whose pulp is intervening earth and towns and cities are the ova of insects in their axils when the sun withdraws and the sand ceases to flow but in the morning the streams will start once more and branch and branch again into a myriad of others you here see perchance how blood vessels are formed if you look closely you observe that first there pushes forward from the thawing mass a stream of softened sand with a drop-like point like the ball of the finger feeling its way slowly and blindly downward until at last with more heat and moisture as the sun gets higher the most fluid portion in its effort to obey the law to which the most inert also yields separates from the latter and forms for itself a meandering channel or artery within that in which is seen a little silvery stream glancing like lightning from one stage of pulpy leaves or branches to another and ever and anon swallowed up in the sand it is wonderful how rapidly yet perfectly the sand organizes itself as it flows using the best material its mass affords to form the sharp edges of its channel such are the sources of rivers in the silicious manner which the water deposits is perhaps the bony system and in the still finer soil and organic matter the fleshy fiber or cellular tissue what is man but a mass of thawing clay the ball of the human finger is but a drop congealed the fingers and toes flow to their extent from the thawing mass of the body who knows what the human body would expand and flow out to under a more genial heaven is not the hand a spreading palm leaf with its lobes and veins the ear may be regarded fancifully as a lichen umbilicaria on the side of the head with its lobe or drop the lip labium from labor laps or lapses from the sides of the cavernous mouth the nose is a manifest congealed drop or stalactite the chin 
is a still larger drop the confluent dripping of the face the cheeks are a slide from the brows into the valleys of the face opposed and diffused by the cheekbones each rounded lobe of the vegetable leaf too is a thick and now loitering drop larger or smaller the lobes are the fingers of the leaf and as many lobes as it has in so many directions it tends to flow and more heat or other genial influences would have caused it to flow yet farther thus it seemed that this one hillside illustrated the principle of all the operations of nature the maker of this earth but patented a leaf what champollion will decipher this hieroglyphic for us that we may turn over a new leaf at last this phenomenon is more exhilarating to me than the luxuriance and fertility of vineyards true it is somewhat excrementitious in its character and there is no end to the heaps of liver lights and bowels as if the globe were turned wrong side outward but this suggests at least that nature has some bowels and there again is mother of humanity this is the frost coming out of the ground this is spring it precedes the green and flowery spring as mythology precedes regular poetry i know of nothing more purgative of winter fumes and indigestions fresh curls spring from the baldest brow there is nothing inorganic these foliaceous heaps lie along the bank like the slag of a furnace showing that nature is in full blast within the earth is not a mere fragment of dead history stratum upon stratum like the leaves of a book to be studied by geologists and antiquaries chiefly but living poetry like the leaves of a tree which precede flowers and fruit not a fossil earth but a living earth compared with whose great central life all animal and vegetable life is merely parasitic its throes will heave our exuviae from their graves you may melt your metals and cast them into the most beautiful moulds you can they will never excite me like the forms which this molten earth flows out into and not only it but the institutions upon it are plastic like clay in the hands of the potter ere long not only on these banks but on every hill and plain and in every hollow the frost comes out of the ground like a dormant quadruped from its burrow and seeks the sea with music or migrates to other climes in clouds thaw with his gentle persuasion is more powerful than thor with his hammer the one melts the other but breaks in pieces when the ground was partially bare of snow and a few warm days had dried its surface somewhat it was pleasant to compare the first tender signs of the infant year just peeping forth with the stately beauty of the withered vegetation which had withstood the winter life everlasting golden rods pinweeds and graceful wild grasses more obvious and interesting frequently than in summer even as if their beauty was not ripe till then even cotton grass cattails moulins john's wart hard hack meadow sweet and other strong stemmed plants those unexhausted granaries which entertain the earliest birds decent weeds at least 
which widowed nature wears. I am particularly attracted by the arching and sheaf-like top of the wool-grass. It brings back the summer to our winter memories, and is among the forms which art loves to copy, and which in the vegetable kingdom have the same relation to types already in the mind of man that astronomy has. It is an antique style, older than Greek or Egyptian. Many of the phenomena of winter are suggestive of an inexpressible tenderness and fragile delicacy. We are accustomed to hear this king described as a rude and boisterous tyrant, but with the gentleness of a lover he adorns the tresses of summer. At the approach of spring the red squirrels got under my house, two at a time, directly under my feet as I sat reading or writing, and kept up the queerest chuckling and chirruping and vocal pirouetting and gurgling sounds that ever were heard. And when I stamped they only chirruped the louder, as if past all fear and respect in their mad pranks, defying humanity to stop them. No, you don't! Chickadee! Chickadee! They were wholly deaf to my arguments, or failed to perceive their force, and fell into a strain of invective that was irresistible. The first sparrow of spring, the year beginning with younger hope than ever, the faint silvery warblings heard over the partially bare and moist fields from the bluebird, the song sparrow and the red wing, as if the last flakes of winter tinkled as they fell. What at such a time are histories, chronologies, traditions, and all written revelations? The brooks sing carols and glees to the spring. The marsh hawk, sailing low over the meadow, is already seeking the first slimy life that awakes. The sinking sound of melting snow is heard in all dells, and the ice dissolves apace in the ponds. The grass flames up on the hillsides like a spring fire. A primitus oritur herba imbribus primoribus evocata as if the earth sent forth an inward heat to greet the returning sun. Not yellow, but green is the color of its flame, the symbol of perpetual youth, the grass blade, like a long green ribbon, streams from the sod into the summer. Checked indeed by the frost, but anon pushing on again, lifting its spear of last year's hay with the fresh life below. It grows as steadily as the rill oozes out of the ground. It is almost identical with that, for in the growing days of June, when the rills are dry, the grass blades are their channels and from year to year the herds drink at this perennial green stream, and the mower draws from it betimes their winter supply. So our human life but dies down to its root, and still puts forth its green blade to eternity. Walden is melting apace. There is a canal two rods wide along the northerly and westerly sides, and wider still at the east end. A great field of ice has cracked off from the main body. I hear a song sparrow singing from the bushes on the shore. Olit, 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 chip, 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 chichar, chawis, whis, whis. He too is helping to crack it. How handsome the great sweeping curves in the edge of the ice! 
answering somewhat to those of the shore, but more regular. It is unusually hard, owing to the recent severe but transient cold, and all watered or waved like a palace floor. But the wind slides eastward over its opaque surface in vain, till it reaches the living surface beyond. It is glorious to behold this ribbon of water sparkling in the sun, the bare face of the pond full of glee and youth, as if it spoke the joy of the fishes within it, and of the sands on its shore, a silvery sheen as from the scales of a leuciscus, as it were all one active fish. Such is the contrast between winter and spring. Walden was dead, and is alive again. But this spring is broke up more steadily, as I have said. The change from storm and winter to serene and mild weather, from dark and sluggish hours to bright and elastic ones, is a memorable crisis which all things proclaim. It is seemingly instantaneous at last. Suddenly an influx of light filled my house, though the evening was at hand, and the clouds of winter still overhung it, and the eaves were dripping with sleety rain. I looked out the window, and, lo, where yesterday was cold gray ice there lay the transparent pond, already calm and full of hopes as in a summer evening, reflecting a summer evening sky in its bosom, though none was visible overhead, as if it had intelligence with some remote horizon. I heard a robin in the distance, the first I had heard for many a thousand years, methought, the same sweet and powerful song as of yore. Oh, the evening robin, at the end of a New England summer day. If I could ever find the twig he sits upon, I mean he, I mean the twig. This at last is not the Turdus Migratorius, the pitch pines and shrub oaks about my house, which had so long drooped, suddenly resumed their several characters, looked brighter, greener, and more erect and alive, as if effectually cleansed and restored by the rain. I knew that it would not rain any more. You may tell by looking at any twig of the forest, I at your very woodpile, whether its winter is past or not. As it grew darker, I was startled by the honking of geese, flying low over the woods like weary travelers getting in late from southern lakes, and indulging at last in unrestrained complaint and mutual consolation. Standing at my door, I could hear the rush of their wings. When, driving toward my house, they suddenly spied my light, and with hushed clamor wheeled and settled in the pond. So I came in, and shut the door, and passed my first spring night in the woods. In the morning I watched the geese from the door through the mist, sailing in the middle of the pond, fifty rods off, so large and tumultuous that Walden appeared like an artificial pond for their amusement. But when I stood on the shore they at once rose up with a great flapping of wings at the signal of their commander, and when they had got into rank circled about over my head, twenty-nine of them, and then steered straight to Canada, with a regular honk from the leader at intervals trusting to break their fast in muddier pools. A plump of ducks rose at the same time, and took the route 
to the north in the wake of their noisier cousins. For a week I heard the circling, groping clangor of some solitary goose in the foggy mornings, seeking its companion, and still peopling the woods with the sound of a larger life than they could sustain. In April the pigeons were seen again flying express in small flocks, and in due time I heard the martins twittering over my clearing, though it had not seemed that the township contained so many that it could afford me any, and I fancied that they were peculiarly of the ancient race that dwelt in hollow trees ere white men came. In almost all climes the tortoise and the frog are among the precursors and heralds of this season, and birds fly with song and glancing plumage, and plants spring and bloom, and winds blow to correct this slight oscillation of the poles and preserve the equilibrium of nature. As every season seems best to us in its turn, so the coming of spring is like the creation of cosmos out of chaos, and the realization of the golden age. Iurus ad aurorum nabatheque regna recessist, persidac e radis juga subdita matutinis. The east wind withdrew to her aurora and the Nabathean kingdom, and the Persian and the ridges placed under the morning rays. Man was born, whether the artificer of things, the origin of a better world, made him from the divine seed, or the earth, being recent and lately sundered from the high ether, retained some seeds of cognate heaven. A single gentle rain makes the grass many shades greener, so our prospects brighten on the influx of better thoughts. We should be blessed if we lived in the present always, and took advantage of every accident that befell us, like the grass which confesses the influence of the slightest dew that falls on it, and did not spend our time in atoning for the neglect of past opportunities, which we call doing our duty. We loiter in winter while it is already spring. In a pleasant spring morning all men's sins are forgiven. Such a day is a truce to vice. While such a sun holds out to burn, the vilest sinner may return. Through our own recovered innocence we discern the innocence of our neighbors. You may have known your neighbor yesterday for a thief, a drunkard, or a sensualist, and merely pitied or despised him, and despaired of the world. But the sun shines bright and warm this first spring morning, recreating the world, and you meet him at some serene work, and see how it is exhausted and debauched veins expand with still joy and bless the new day feel the spring influence with the innocence of infancy and all his faults are forgotten there is not only an atmosphere of good will about him but even a savor of holiness groping for expression blindly and ineffectually perhaps like a newborn instinct and for a short hour the south hillside echoes to no vulgar jest you see some innocent fair shoots preparing to burst from his gnarled rind and try another year's life 
tender and fresh as the youngest plant. Even he has entered into the joy of his lord. Why the jailer does not leave open his prison doors, why the judge does not dismiss his case, why the preacher does not dismiss his congregation, it is because they do not obey the hint which God gives them, nor accept the pardon which he freely offers to all. A return to goodness produced each day in the tranquil and beneficent breath of the morning causes that in respect to the love of virtue and the hatred of vice one approaches a little the primitive nature of man as the sprouts of the forest which has been felled in like manner the evil which one does in the interval of a day prevents the germs of virtues which began to spring up again from developing themselves and destroys them. After the germs of virtue have thus been prevented many times from developing themselves, then the beneficent breath of evening does not suffice to preserve them. As soon as the breath of evening does not suffice longer to preserve them, then the nature of man does not differ much from that of the brute. Men, seeing the nature of this man like that of a brute, think that he has never possessed the innate faculty of reason. Are those the true and natural sentiments of man? The golden age was first created, which without any avenger, spontaneously without law, cherished fidelity and rectitude. Punishment and fear were not, nor were threatening words read on suspended brass, nor did the suppliant crowd fear the words of their judge, but were safe without an avenger. Not yet the pine felled on its mountains had descended to the liquid waves that it might see a foreign world, and mortals knew no shores but their own. There was eternal spring, and placid zephyrs with warm blasts soothed the flowers born without seed. On the twenty-ninth of April, as I was fishing from the bank of the river near the nine-acre corner bridge, standing on the quaking grass and willow roots, where the muskrats lurk, I heard a singular rattling sound somewhat like that of the sticks which boys play with their fingers, when looking up I observed a very slight and graceful hawk, like a night hawk, alternately soaring like a ripple and tumbling a rod or two over and over, showing the underside of its wings which gleamed like a satin ribbon in the sun, or like the pearly inside of a shell. This sight reminded me of falconry, and what nobleness and poetry are associated with that sport. The Merlin, it seemed to me, it might be called, but I care not for its name. It was the most ethereal flight I had ever witnessed. It did not simply flutter like a butterfly, nor soar like the larger hawks, but it sported with proud reliance in the fields of air, mounting again and again with its strange chuckle. It repeated its free and beautiful fall, turning over and over like a kite, and then recovering from its lofty tumbling as if it had never set its foot on terra firma. It appeared to have no companion in the universe, sporting there alone, and to need none but the morning and the ether with which it played. It was not lonely, but made all the earth lonely beneath it. Where was the parent which hatched it, 
its kindred and its father in the heavens. The tenant of the air, it seemed related to the earth but by an egg hatched some time in the crevice of a crag, or was its native nest made in the angle of a cloud, woven of the rainbow's trimmings and the sunset sky, and lined with some soft midsummer haze caught up from earth, its airy, now some cliffy cloud. Beside this I got a rare mess of golden and silver and bright cuprius fishes, which looked like a string of jewels. Ah, I have penetrated to those meadows on the morning of many a first spring day, jumping from hummock to hummock, from willow root to willow root, when the wild river valley and the woods were bathed in so pure and bright a light as would have waked the dead if they had been slumbering in their graves, as some suppose. There needs no stronger proof of immortality. All things must live in such a light. O oh, death, where was thy sting? O oh, grave, where was thy victory then? Our village life would stagnate if it were not for the unexplored forests and meadows which surround it. We need the tonic of wildness, to wade sometimes in marshes where the bittern and the meadow hen lurk and hear the booming of the snipe, to smell the whispering sedge where only some wilder and more solitary fowl builds her nest, and the mink crawls with its belly close to the ground. At the same time that we are earnest to explore and learn all things, we require that all things be mysterious and unexplorable, that land and sea be infinitely wild, unsurveyed and unfathomed by us because unfathomable. We can never have enough of nature. We must be refreshed by the sight of inexhaustible vigor, vast and titanic features, the sea coast with its wrecks, the wilderness with its living and its decaying trees, the thunder cloud, and the rain which lasts three weeks and produces freshets. We need to witness our own limits transgressed and some life pasturing freely where we never wander. We are cheered when we observe the vulture feeding on the carrion which disgusts and disheartens us, and deriving health and strength from the repast. There was a dead horse in the hollow by the path to my house, which compelled me sometimes to go out of my way, especially in the night when the air was heavy but the assurance it gave me of the strong appetite and inviolable health of nature was my compensation for this. I love to see that nature is so rife with life that myriads can be afforded to be sacrificed and suffered to prey on one another, that tender organizations can be so serenely squashed out of existence like pulp, tadpoles which herons gobble up, and tortoises and toads run over in the road, and that sometimes it has rained flesh and blood. With a liability to accident, we must see how little account is to be made of it. The impression made on a wise man is that of universal innocence. Poison is not poisonous after all, nor are any wounds fatal. Compassion is a very untenable ground. It must be expeditious. Its pleadings will not bear to be stereotyped. Early in May, the oaks, hickories, maples, and other trees, just putting out amidst the pine woods around the pond, 
imparted a brightness like sunshine to the landscape, especially in cloudy days, as if the sun were breaking through mists and shining faintly on the hillsides as here and there. On the third or fourth of May I saw a loon in the pond, and during the first week of the month I heard the whippoorwill, the brown thrasher, the veery, the wood peewee, the chewink, and other birds. I had heard the wood thrush long before. The phoebe had already come once more and looked in at my door and window to see if my house was cavern-like enough for her, sustaining herself on humming wings with clinched talons, as if she held by the air which she surveyed the premises. The sulphur-like pollen of the pitch-pine soon covered the ground, and the stones and rotten wood along the shore, so that you could have collected a barrel full. This is the sulphur showers we bear of. Even in Kalidas drama of Sakontala, we read of rills dyed yellow with the golden dust of the lotus. And so the seasons went rolling on into summer, as one rambles into higher and higher grass. Thus was my first year's life in the woods completed, and the second year was similar to it. I finally left Walden, September 6th, 1847. End of chapter 17This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Conclusion To the sick, the doctors wisely recommend a change of air and scenery. Thank heaven, here is not all the world. The buckeye does not grow in New England, and the mockingbird is rarely heard here. The wild goose is more of a cosmopolite than we. He breaks his fast in Canada, takes a luncheon in the Ohio, and plumes himself for the night in a southern bayou. Even the bison, to some extent, keeps pace with the seasons cropping the pastures of the Colorado only till the greener and sweeter grass awaits him by the Yellowstone. Yet we think that if rail fences are pulled down and stone walls piled up on our farms, bounds are henceforth set to our lives, and our fates decided. If you are chosen town clerk, forsooth, you cannot go to Tierra del Fuego this summer, but you may go to the land of infernal fire nevertheless. The universe is wider than our views of it. Yet we should oftener look over the tafferel of our craft, like curious passengers, and not make the voyage like stupid sailors picking oakum. The other side of the globe is but the home of our correspondent. Our voyaging is only great circle sailing and the doctors prescribe for diseases of the skin merely. One hastens to southern Africa to chase the giraffe. But surely that is not the game he would be after. How long, pray, would a man hunt giraffes, if he could? Snipes and woodcocks also may afford rare sport, but I trust it would be nobler game to shoot one's self. Direct your eye inward and you'll find a thousand regions in your mind yet undiscovered. Travel them, and be expert in home cosmography. What does Africa, what does the West stand for? Is not our own interior white on the chart, black though it may prove, like the coast when discovered? Is it 
the source of the Nile or the Niger or the Mississippi or a northwest passage around this continent that we would find? Are these the problems which most concern mankind? Is Franklin the only man who is lost, that his wife should be so earnest to find him? Does Mr. Grinnell know where he himself is? Be rather the Mongo Park, the Lewis and Clark and Frobisher of your own streams and oceans. Explore your own higher latitudes, with shiploads of preserved meats to support you, if they be necessary, and pile the empty cans sky-high for a sign. Were preserved meats invented to preserve meat merely? Nay, be a Columbus to whole new continents and worlds within you opening new channels, not of trade, but of thought. Every man is the lord of a realm beside which the earthly empire of the Tsar, a hummock left by the ice. Yet some can be patriotic who have no self-respect, and sacrifice the greater to the less. They love the soil which makes their graves, but have no sympathy with the spirit which may still animate their clay. Patriotism is a maggot in their heads. What was the meaning of that South Sea exploring expedition with all its parade and expense, but an indirect recognition of the fact that there are continents and seas in the moral world to which every man is an isthmus or an inlet? yet unexplored by him, but that it is easier to sail many thousand miles through cold and storm and cannibals in a government ship, with five hundred men and boys to assist one, than it is to explore the private sea, the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean of one's being alone. Eret et extramos alter scrutetor Iberos, plus habit hic vitae, plus habit il vie. Let them wander and scrutinize the outlandish Australians. I have more of God, they more of the road. It is not worth the while to go round the world to count the cats in Zanzibar. Yet do this even till you can do better and you may perhaps find some symes hole by which to get at the inside at last. England and France, Spain and Portugal, Gold Coast and Slave Coast, all front on this private sea, but no bark from them has ventured out of sight of land, though it is without doubt the direct way to India. If you would learn to speak all tongues and conform to the customs of all nations, if you would travel farther than all travelers, be naturalized in all climes, and cause the sphinx to dash her head against a stone, even obey the precept of the old philosopher, and explore thyself. Herein are demanded the eye and the nerve. Only the defeated and deserters go to the wars, cowards that run away and enlist. Start now on that farthest western way, which does not pause at the Mississippi or the Pacific, nor conduct toward a worn-out China or Japan, but leads on direct, a tangent to this sphere, summer and winter, day and night, sun down, moon down, and at last earth down too. It is said that Mirabeau took to highway robbery to ascertain what degree of resolution was necessary in order to place oneself in formal opposition to the most sacred laws of society. He declared that a soldier who fights in the ranks does not require half so much courage as a footpad, that honor and religion have never stood in the way of a well-considered and a firm resolve. 
This was manly as the world goes, and yet it was idle, if not desperate. A saner man would have found himself, often enough, in formal opposition, to what are deemed the most sacred laws of society, through obedience to yet more sacred laws, and so have tested his resolution without going out of his way. It is not for a man to put himself in such an attitude to society, but to maintain himself in whatever attitude he find himself through obedience to the laws of his being, which will never be one of opposition to a just government, if he should chance to meet with such. I left the woods for as good a reason as I went there. Perhaps it seemed to me that I had several more lives to live, and could not spare any more time for that one. It is remarkable how easily and insensibly we fall into a particular route, and make a beaten track for ourselves. I had not lived there a week before my feet wore a path from my door to the pond side, and though it is five or six years since I trod it, it is still quite distinct. It is true, I fear, that others may have fallen into it, and so help to keep it open. The surface of the earth is soft and impressible by the feet of men, and so with the paths which the mind travels. How worn and dusty, then, must be the highways of the world, how deep the ruts of tradition and conformity. I did not wish to take a cabin passage, but rather to go before the mast and on the deck of the world, for there I could best see the moonlight amid the mountains. I do not wish to go below now. I learned this, at least, by my experiment that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams, and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. He will put some things behind, will pass an invisible boundary, new, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within him or the old laws be expanded and interpreted in his favor in a more liberal sense, and he will live with the license of a higher order of beings. In proportion as he simplifies his life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex, and solitude will not be solitude, nor poverty poverty, nor weakness weakness. If you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put the foundations under them. It is a ridiculous demand which England and America make, that you shall speak so that they can understand you. Neither men nor toadstools grow so, as if that were important and there were not enough to understand you without them. As if nature could support but one order of understandings, could not sustain birds as well as quadrupeds, flying as well as creeping things, and hush and woe, which bright can understand, were the best English. As if there were safety in stupidity alone, I fear chiefly lest my expression may not be extravagant enough, may not wander far enough beyond the narrow limits of my daily experience, so as to be adequate to the truth of which I have been convinced. Extravagance. It depends on how you are yarded. The migrating buffalo which seeks new pastures in another latitude is not extravagant, like the cow which kicks over the pail, leaps the cow-yard fence, and runs after her calf in milking time. I desire to speak somewhere without bounds, like a man in a waking moment, to men in their waking moments, for I am convinced 
that I cannot exaggerate enough even to lay the foundation of a true expression. Who that has heard a strain of music feared then lest he should speak extravagantly any more for ever, in view of the future or possible, we should live quite laxly and undefined in front, our outlines dim and misty on that side, as our shadows reveal an insensible perspiration toward the sun. The volatile truth of our words should continually betray the inadequacy of the residual statement. Their truth is instantly translated. Its literal monument alone remains. The words which express our faith and piety are not definite, yet they are significant and fragrant, like frankincense to superior natures. Why level downward to our dullest perception always, and praise that as common sense? The commonest sense is the sense of men asleep, which they express by snoring. Sometimes we are inclined to class those who are once and a half witted with the half witted, because we appreciate only a third part of their wit. Some would find fault with the morning red, if they ever got up early enough. They pretend, as I hear, that the verses of Kabir have four different senses, illusion, spirit, intellect, and the exoteric doctrine of the Vedas. But in this part of the world it is considered a ground for complaint if a man's writings admit of more than one interpretation, while England endeavors to cure the potato rot. Will not any endeavor to cure the brain rot, which prevails so much more widely and fatally? I do not suppose that I have attained to obscurity, but I should be proud if no more fatal fault were found with my pages on this score than was found with the Walden ice. Southern customers objected to its blue color, which is the evidence of its purity, as if it were muddy and preferred the Cambridge ice, which is white, but tastes of weeds. The purity men love is like the mists which envelop the earth, and not like the azure ether beyond. Some are dinning in our ears that we Americans, and moderns generally, are intellectual dwarves compared with the ancients, or even the Elizabethan men. But what is that to the purpose? A living dog is better than a dead lion. Shall a man go and hang himself because he belongs to the race of pygmies and not be the biggest pygmy that he can? Let every one mind his own business, and endeavor to be what he was made. Why should we be in such a desperate haste to succeed, and in such desperate enterprises? If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. It is not important that he should mature as soon as an apple tree or an oak. Shall he turn his spring into summer? If the condition of things which we were made for is not yet, what were any reality which we can substitute? We will not be shipwrecked on a vain reality. Shall we with pains erect a heaven of blue glass over ourselves, though when it is done we shall be sure to gaze still at the true ethereal heaven far above, as if the former were not? There was an artist in the city of Koru who was disposed to strive after perfection. One day it came into his mind to make a staff. Having considered that in an imperfect work time is an ingredient, but in a perfect work time does not enter, 
he said to himself, It shall be perfect in all respects, though I should do nothing else in my life. He proceeded instantly to the forest for wood, being resolved that it should not be made of unsuitable material, and as he searched for and rejected stick after stick, his friends gradually deserted him, for they grew old in their works and died. But he grew not older by a moment. His singleness of purpose and resolution and his elevated piety endowed him, without his knowledge, with perennial youth. As he made no compromise with time, time kept out of his way, and only sighed at a distance because he could not overcome him. Before he had found a stock in all respects suitable, the city of Kuru was a hoary ruin, and he sat on one of its mounds to peel the stick. Before he had given it the proper shape, the dynasty of the Kandahars was at an end, and with the point of the stick he wrote the name of the last of that race in the sand, and then resumed his work. By the time he had smoothed and polished the staff, Kalpa was no longer the pole star, and ere he had put on the ferul and the head adorned with precious stones, Brahma had awoke and slumbered many times. But why do I stay to mention these things? When the finishing stroke was put to his work, it suddenly expanded before the eyes of the astonished artist into the fairest of all the creations of Brahma. He had made a new system in making a staff, a world with full and fair proportions, in which, though the old cities and dynasties had passed away, fairer and more glorious ones had taken their place and now he saw by the heap of shavings still fresh at his feet that for him and his work the former lapse of time had been an illusion, and that no more time had elapsed than is required for a single scintillation of the brain of Brahma to fall on and inflame the tinder of a mortal brain. The material was pure, and his art was pure. How could the result be other than wonderful? No face which we give to a matter will steed us so well at last as the truth. This alone wears well. For the most part we are not where we are, but in a false position. Through an infinity of our natures we suppose a case and put ourselves into it and hence are in two cases at the same time, and it is doubly difficult to get out. In sane moments we regard only the facts, the case, that is. Say what you have to say, not what you ought. Any truth is better than make-believe. Tom Hyde, the tinker, standing on the gallows, was asked if he had anything to say. Tell the tailors, said he, to remember to make a knot in their thread before they take the first stitch. His companion's prayer is forgotten. However mean your life is, meet it and live it. Do not shun it and call it hard names. It is not so bad as you are. It looks poorest when you are richest. The fault-finder will find faults even in paradise. Love your life, poor as it is. You may perhaps have some pleasant, thrilling, glorious hours, even in a poor house. The setting sun is reflected from the windows of the almshouse as brightly as from the rich man's abode. The snow melts before its door as early in the spring. I do not see but a quiet mind may live as contentedly there, and have as cheering thoughts as in a palace. The town's poor seem to me often to live the most independent lives of any. 
Maybe they are simply great enough to receive without misgiving. Most think that they are above being supported by the town. But it oftener happens that they are not above supporting themselves by dishonest means, which should be more disreputable. Cultivate poverty like a garden herb, like sage. Do not trouble yourself much to get new things, whether clothes or friends. Turn the old, return to them. Things do not change, we change. Sell your clothes and keep your thoughts. God will see that you do not want society. If I were confined to a corner of a garret all my days like a spider, the world would be just as large to me while I had my thoughts about me. The philosopher said, From an army of three divisions one can take away its general and put it in disorder. From the man, the most abject and vulgar, one cannot take away his thought. Do not seek so anxiously to be developed, to subject yourself to many influences to be played on. It is all dissipation. Humility like darkness reveals the heavenly lights. The shadows of poverty and meanness gather around us, and lo, creation widens to our view. We are often reminded that if there were bestowed on us the wealth of Croesus, our aims must still be the same, and our means essentially the same. Moreover, if you are restricted in your range by poverty, if you cannot buy books and newspapers, for instance, you are but confined to the most significant and vital experiences. You are compelled to deal with the material which yields the most sugar and the most starch. It is life near the bone where it is sweetest. You are defended from being a trifler. No man loses ever on a lower level by magnanimity on a higher. Superfluous wealth can buy superfluities only. Money is not required to buy one necessary of the soul. I live in the angle of a leaden wall, into whose composition was poured a little alloy of bell metal. Often in the repose of my midday there reaches my ears a confused tintinabulum from without. It is the noise of my contemporaries. My neighbors tell me of their adventures with famous gentlemen and ladies, what notabilities they met at the dinner table. But I am no more interested in such things than in the content of the Daily Times. The interest and the conversation are about costume and manners, chiefly. But a goose is a goose still. Dress it as you will. They tell me of California and Texas, of England and the Indies, of the Honorable Mr. Blank, of Georgia or of Massachusetts. All transient and fleeting phenomena, till I am ready to leap from their courtyard like the Mameluke Bay. I delight to come to my bearings, not walk in procession with pomp and parade in a conspicuous place but to walk even with the builder of the universe, if I may, not to live in this restless, nervous, bustling, trivial nineteenth century, but stand or sit thoughtfully while it goes by. What are men celebrating? They are all on a committee of arrangements, and hourly expect a speech from somebody. God is only the president of the day, and Webster is his orator. I love to weigh, to settle, to gravitate toward that which most strongly and rightfully attracts me, 
not hang by the beam of the scale and try to weigh less, not suppose a case, but take the case that is, to travel the only path I can, and that on which no power can resist me. It affords me no satisfaction to commerce, to spring an arch before I have got a solid foundation. Let us not play at kitly benders. There is a solid bottom everywhere. We read that the traveler asked the boy if the swamp before him had a hard bottom. The boy replied that it had. But presently the traveler's horse sank in up to the girths, and he observed to the boy, I thought you said this bog had a hard bottom. So it has, answered the latter, but you've not got halfway to it yet. So it is with the bogs and quicksands of society. But he is an old boy that knows it. Only what is thought, said or done, at a certain rare coincidence, is good. I would not be one of those who will foolishly drive a nail into mere lathe and plastering. Such a deed would keep me awake nights. Give me a hammer, and let me feel for the furring. Do not depend on the putty. Drive a nail home, and clinch it so faithfully that you can wake up in the night and think of your work with satisfaction a work at which you would not be ashamed to invoke the muse. So will help you God, and so only. Every nail driven should be as another rivet in the machine of the universe, you carrying on the work, rather than love, than money, than fame. Give me truth. I sat at a table, where rich food and wine in abundance and obsequious attendance, but sincerity and truth were not, and I went away hungry from the inhospitable board. The hospitality was as cold as the ices. I thought that there was no need of ice to freeze them. They talked to me of the age of the wine and the fame of the vintage, but I thought of an older, a newer, and purer wine, of a more glorious vintage which they had not got and could not buy. The style, the house and grounds, and entertainment pass for nothing with me. I called on the king but he made me wait in his hall, and conducted like a man incapacitated for hospitality. There was a man in my neighborhood who lived in a hollow tree. His manners were truly regal. I should have done better had I called on him. How long shall we sit in our porticos, practicing idle and musty virtues, which any work would make impertinent? as if one were to begin the day with long suffering, and hire a man to hoe his potatoes, and in the afternoon go forth to practice Christian meekness and charity with goodness aforethought. Consider the china, pride, and stagnant self-complacency of mankind. This generation inclines a little to congratulate itself on being the last of an illustrious line and in Boston, and London, and Paris, and Rome, thinking of its long descent, it speaks of its progress in art, and science, and literature with satisfaction. There are the records of the philosophical societies, and the public eulogies of great men. It is the good Adam contemplating his own virtue. Yes, we have done great deeds, and sung divine songs which shall never die. That is, as long as we can remember them. The learned societies and great men of Assyria, where are they? What youthful philosophers and experimentalists we are! 
there is not one of my readers who has yet lived a whole human life. These may be but the spring months in the life of the race. If we have had the seven years itch, we have not seen the seventeen-year locust yet in Concord. We are acquainted with a mere pellicle of the globe on which we live. Most have not delved six feet beneath the surface, nor leaped as many above it. We know not where we are. Beside, we are sound asleep nearly half our time. Yet we esteem ourselves wise, and have an established order on the surface. Truly we are deep thinkers, we are ambitious spirits. As I stand over the insect crawling amid the pine needles on the forest floor, and endeavoring to conceal itself from my sight, and ask myself why it will cherish those humble thoughts, and bide its head from me who might perhaps be its benefactor, and impart to its race some cheering information, I am reminded of the greater benefactor and intelligence that stands over me the human insect. There is an incessant influx of novelty into the world, and yet we tolerate incredible dullness. I need only suggest what kind of sermons are still listened to in the most enlightened countries. There are such words as joy and sorrow, but they are only the burden of a psalm, sung with a nasal twang, while we believe in the ordinary and mean. We think that we can change our clothes only. It is said that the British Empire is very large and respectable, and the United States are a first-rate power. We do not believe that a tide rises and falls behind every man which can float the British Empire like a chip, if he should ever harbor it in his mind. Who knows what sort of seventeen-year locust will next come out of the ground? The government of the world I live in was not framed like that of Britain in after-dinner conversations over the wine. The life in us is like the water in the river. It may rise this year higher than man has ever known it, and flood the parched uplands. Even this may be the eventful year which will drown out all our muskrats. It was not always dry land where we dwell. I see far inland the banks which the stream anciently washed before science began to record its freshets. Every one has heard the story which has gone the rounds of New England of a strong and beautiful bug which came out of the dry leaf of an old table of apple-tree wood, which had stood in a farmer's kitchen for sixty years, first in Connecticut and afterward in Massachusetts, from an egg deposited in the living tree many years earlier still, as appeared by counting the annual layers beyond it, which was heard gnawing out for several weeks, hatched perchance by the heat of an urn. Who does not feel his faith in a resurrection and immortality strengthened by hearing of this. Who knows what beautiful and winged life, whose egg has been buried for ages under many concentric layers of woodenness in the dead dry life of society, deposited at first in the alburnum of the green and living tree, which has been gradually converted into the semblance of its well-seasoned tomb, heard perchance gnawing out now for years by the astonished family of man as they sat round the festive board, may unexpectedly come forth from amidst society's most trivial and hand-celled furniture to enjoy its perfect summer life at last. I do not say that John or Jonathan will realize all this, but such is the character of that morrow 
which mere lapse of time can never make to dawn. The light which puts out our eyes is darkness to us. Only that day dawns to which we are awake. There is more day to dawn. The sun is but a morning star. End of Conclusion End of Walden This book read by Gordon Mackenzie Finished July the 7th, 2006